Red carpets or interrogation rooms for Chinese students and scholars visiting the U.S.? During the summit between the presidents of China and the United States last November in San Francisco, both sides agreed to promote people-to-people -people exchanges. Chinese President Xi Jinping extended an invitation for 50,000 U.S. students to visit China over the next five years. Since then, groups of U.S. students have made the trip, and the good news is the opposite is also happening. More Chinese students are getting the opportunity to see America for themselves, including a group here in the studio from Beijing Foreign Studies University. But some members of that delegation had to go through hours of interrogation at U.S. Customs. This came after while Chinese ambassador to the U.S. has protested over mistreatment of Chinese students with the valid visas upon entry to the U.S. So what has been the experience of the delegation? from the university. What have they learned about the U.S. and bilateral ties? I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Professor Xie Tao, Dean of the School of International Relations and Diplomacy, who is head of the delegation, and three members of the team, Ling Jiao Wen, Zhang Qingzhi, and Xu Cheng Cheng joining us. The warmest welcome to all of you to the point. So uh, I understand that upon entry to the United States, there was some unexpected episode which happened to you as well. Professor Shea, would you like to share with us what happened to you at the border? Yeah. Sure, Lucian. Uh, it's so great to be back in, in your studio. Uh, after nearly 16 hour, 13 hours of flight and we arrived in Chicago, uh, I stayed in Chicago for six years uh, during my PhD study, so I was very excited to get him back to Chicago, especially with my own students this time. Unfortunately, when I go through the immigration. Uh, I was stopped by the immigration officer and he said, you have to step aside. We need to verify some additional information for you and your delegation members. So all the six students plus myself were uh, guided towards the uh, you know, other side of the counter and we waited for an officer to come in. And so he led me into a room where I was uh, questioned or you could use the word interrogated for nearly three hours while two of my students also uh, had a similar, uh, very uh, you know, horrible experience. Uh, I would say this shocked me. Um, you know, I spent six years studying there. I've been studying America. You know, I've been committed myself to promoting a better U.S.-China relationship. So out of all these things, you know, I've never expected that I would you know, be subjected to this kind of a treatment. Mm -hmm. And so three hours of questioning, you know, all kinds of questions. Have you ever uh, wondered, or is there any explanation that uh, as to why you were put through that kind of interrogation? Could, have you thought about it or found I out about it? I asked the officer who questioned me, I said, you know, why was I selected of all these uh, you know, people coming in from the same flight? And he said, you know, because you are taking a group of students. So I presume they wanted to check Chinese students going to the United States. So I explained to him that you know, we are not regular F1 visa holder students. Instead, they are B1, B2 visa holders and they came to the United short -term States. Short-term visit. Yeah, just for a short-term visit. Mm. So that's the reason he told me. Uh, and he also, uh, my cell phone and my computer was taken away. Uh, I don't know, so they uh, scanned the, uh, my cell phone, of course, and so they came back and asked me you know, a lot of questions. You know. so, so I feel this is a very unfair treatment. And as far as I know, I can tell you, Liu Xin, I know far more cases of Chinese scholars and students who have been questioned for extended hours by U.S. immigration officers mm -hmm. than the reported case of uh, American scholars and students who reportedly have been questioned by Chinese authorities. And I know this for sure. And also I got confirmed by my American counterparts. And so they feel very outraged and upset by my experience too. Uh, let me ask uh, your, your students here, um, Qing Zhi and Jia Wen, when you were entering the United States, did you also go through the interrogation or just uh, Professor Xie was, you know, questioned for hours, what would happen to you at that moment? Uh, no, we didn't, but some of our uh, fellows were questioned and we were uh, put in a very uh, empty room and we just waited for them to come out. Mm. For how long you had to wait? Uh, three hours maybe, because we have to wait all the uh, students together. Yeah. Mm. And uh, Qingzhi, what is your um, 
experience? Did you go through the interrogation as I well? I didn't, but I think... You did? I didn't. You but didn't? my friends did. Mm. Um, he just went through the dreadful <laughs> the process. We were just waiting for like three hours there, mm. and we ate the food there. It was kind of terrible. I don't know. Um, so it was a surprising experience mm. to me, and it was kind of new experience. Mm. i rather not go through that again, I think. Well, especially given the background, uh, we checked the numbers, for instance, by the U.S. Embassy and by the U.S. Ambassador here to China. It seems the message has been that they welcome Chinese scholars and China, mm. and they want to facilitate their mm. either studying or visiting the United States. That seems to be the impression, but what, hap what is happening seems to be uh, a different kind of uh, reality. Mm. Xi Cheng Cheng, uh, online, on Zoom, I want to bring you in here. Uh, what did you go through during <coughs> that process? Were you screened? Let's not use the word in target. Were you screened um, when you uh, entered Chicago at that time? Well, I was fortunately enough not to have been interrogated personally, but two of our fellow students did, and we had to wait in the uh, wait outside for the entire time, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere until they uh, went back out. And uh, one of our fellow students did get interrogated, and during his interrogation, he wasn't allowed to talk to us or to make any eye contact with us personally. So we were pretty surprised when he brushed past us without talking to us. So I thought the situation was pretty serious. Okay. Well, Professor Shear, let's get the complete picture here. We don't want to scare people away. So um, it seems that there have been more students visiting each side, and yet mm -hmm. it seems that at least part of the government on the United States, or maybe there are some American students encountering problems here upon entering China. It seems that uh, uh, not all government is on board to welcome visitor, young visitors from the other side. Right. Uh, I think you hit upon a very good point, that is uh, intergovernment agency coordination. So maybe at the very top level, the leadership says, you know, we do want to welcome Chinese students coming to America. but you go down to the DHS level, that is the immigration officer at the mm. airports, and they are law enforcement people, and so they have a lot of discretion. And so maybe some of these guys you know, don't really follow the rules, and maybe they personally have some bad feelings towards some Chinese students. But regardless, I think this has had a very chilling effect on people like my students you know, who may be wondering do I really want to go to America next time? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I should, you know, ch change my choice of going to the UK or Europe. Yeah. Right? Well, are you worried or are you still reasonably optimistic after this trip, having gone through the unpleasant inconveniences at the border? But yet, you also went to, as I said, three states. Right? You had you had extensive experience in exchanges. Um, what is your impression, having gone through the whole trip? Do you think? There is hope that people to people, especially student exchanges, will revitalize between the two countries, or this is going to be a precarious recovery. I would say I'm cautiously optimistic about the future of uh, China US scholarly exchanges. You ask me, you know, is there any change? Like Chen Chen said, definitely there is a change in the atmosphere. Uh, you can feel like our American counterparts are less willing to reach out to us, to accept uh, initiatives uh, from our side. For example, the Chinese government has launched quite a few initiatives to invite American students and scholars to visit China, right? Mm. But you see very few of them are coming back, even though, like you said, in the past couple of weeks, we do see some delegations from right. Columbia, from other universities, right? So, so absolutely, Lucian, there is a change of the downside, that is negative side. People are not so more enthusiastic about coming to China, I mean mm. the American side. Mm. Well. Um as far as we know, um, several groups have visited China and mm. 10 students from California State University Long Beach have just wrapped up their 10-day exchange program in the Chinese city of Qingdao and uh, a CCTV reporter caught up with the team and this is what one of the team members had to say about that experience. Let's listen in. I think the biggest highlight was talking to the other like university students, kind of like really connecting them during the, the trip. And they're like kind of thinking like we're all the same, you know, it's like even though we're like two different countries. I also another thing I took away was just how easy you can bond, like how fast you can bond 
with with the people there. I like after one day, it was just like we were we were, we were close friends yeah. already. Ling Jia Wen, what is your experience having um, tried to bond with your American counterpart? Did you feel similarly? Uh, yes, I feel that uh, during our stay in the U.S., uh, most uh, American or the, all the Americans treated us very friendly. But I'm not sure if they could represent the majority of the American people. I can share you with a story. Uh, I met a boy named Merrick in Emory University, mm -hmm. and he minors in Chinese, and he knew he knows a lot of uh, things like uh, the Chinese classic literature, and he shares with us the book she, uh, he was reading uh, named To Live by Yu Hua. So I saw that he- a Contemporary Chinese yeah, writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that he might have a pretty good command of Chinese culture. But he said that he was born in Florida, where the anti-China uh, atmosphere is a little bit strong. And he told us that uh, the attitude of his parents uh, towards China is not that friendly. Mm -hmm. And maybe because uh, they will follow what the politicians or the media propaganda. And actually, he said, that his parents know little about China just mm. because the anti-China emotion is a So is how a does that make strong. you feel that despite the the parents who may not be interested in China at mm. all, this boy still, he is, you know, at least diving into the Chinese culture? Yeah, I think it is because he studied Chinese and he, he knows something about Chinese culture and he may have some chance like uh, meeting with us and talking to the Chinese people. So he think that uh, the people to people exchange is really <coughs> important just as we, we thought that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Qingzhi, what is your experience uh, when you engaged with the American people or American peers? Did you feel that you could easily talk to them or there was this interest in getting to know you about you or about China or about Chinese culture? Definitely. Uh, in fact, I dreamed about going to the States when I was a kid. So oh. I kind of feel like uh, this is going to be an amazing trip. So. After the trip, I wasn't let down by the States at all. And the first impression of the States is actually people were so nice to me. And after shopping, saying good day, have a good day, good night, and in the elevators, and this uh, made me feel so pleased because I'm an introverted guy. So before I went there, I was super scared. They may scare, scare me because they talk too much, okay? Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, when I talked to this girl called Miranda, who's an undergraduate in an Emory University, was super interested in Chinese mm. movies. Mm. We talked about In the Heat of the Sun by Zhang Wen and Red Sorghum by Zhang Yimou. Mm. We have so much topics to talk about. Mm. Um, I feel like we could be friends if we uh, live, in, live in the same university, yeah. So despite the scary experience at the airport, you actually had a very good time in exchange with your American students. Uh, Xu Chang Chang, what is your experience in California or in the other places that you had? Uh, well, I think uh, I very much agree with both of my fellow students' opinions. I think generally the American people, at least on this trip, is they're very nice to us personally. And um, we I have noticed really that the people, actually the students who are actually involved in Chinese studies or actually getting to know these Chinese cultures and actually making their trip to China, actually when engaged with the people in China, they have generally a more positive view against China and the Chinese people. And also the second point is that when we're interacted people to people, like on a personal level, the American people generally are nice and uh, I would say nicer than we would imagine when we're in China as themselves. And uh, also I would, I would like to point out that uh, even the adults, like the older generations, they may have, I think comparatively, they have um, much of an opinion as, as they formed, as they grew up, as the era, but there's been a positive change in the Gen Z, like the uh, younger generations, that they are more open to changes mm -hmm. and more open to communication as we can 
always communicate on our shared interests and also the friendly relationships that has been built among us. Thank you. Well, what is the biggest surprise to you? I mean, I, I, let me ask this uh, question again to the young people here. Uh, what is the biggest thing that you didn't expect before and, you know, what, what did you find out during the trip? Who would like to pick this up? For me, it's actually um, before we went to the Trump's rally, we were I was scared again because Trump's opinion on China is quite radical, I think. So I, I'm afraid we're the only Asians in the rally. Some people may you say... You may get a, a, attacked? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I was terrified. But after, uh, when I got there, people were super nice. And there was this old lady... But you know Trump the, yeah. is uh, not, is, how shall I say, um, some of the worst um, names given to the Chinese people were uh, surfaced during the Trump era. I'm putting it very mildly. Do you know that? I mean, he yes. has been using very strong words against Chinese people, against Chinese culture. So although you were not physically threatened <laughs> yeah. in that rally, but you know the consequence yeah, of yeah, yeah. Uh, what he's doing. Yeah, we were standing in the front row, so we we're super close to Trump. Mm -hmm. And every time he's talk about China, I feel like, oh, he's not watching us. So I was kind of terrified. But what did you learn from attending this rally? Um, for me, is that I kind of don't like Trump supporters, to be honest, uh, because I haven't got there. But after I went there, I feel like everybody on on the camp on the rally it was super nice individually. All right. To be honest. Okay. Um, even though they're uh, Trump supporters. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you have the right to feel the way you do. Jia Wen, what is your your um, biggest surprise takeaway? Uh, for me, I think that it was amazing for us to be able uh, to witness the whole process of the Republican caucus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a friend of us, uh, he actually he is a Democrat, but he pretended to to be a Republican and he just uh, uh, went to the caucus side and that's why he could lead us to the side too because uh, he said uh, he said to the uh, staff there that I have brought some friends of mine to to observe the caucus process mm. and another amazing point is that the, the how to say the informal uh, process of the caucus because we would like to uh, hold an election or uh, organize a voting we have to set up at least two supervisors to make sure the outcome to be totally uh, open fair transparent but uh, in the caucus in the Republican uh, there was no one uh, supervising the whole process and they just uh, picked up a volunteer from the audience which could be also a voter of them and to help them help them count the uh, ballots. Mm -hmm. so I think it's a little bit, not a little bit, it's very informal and a little casual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, let me go to Prof Professor Shear. You uh, are bringing these young students to open their eyes, right, to see America. Um, are you surprised or are you concerned in any way or another uh, what the information they're getting and what kind of impression they're getting of, of America? Well, um, you know, I, I think I talk to them all the time, right? And we were traveling on the bus and on the airplane. I get a strong sense that each and every one of them is opening their eyes to different views. Like they said, you know, personal level, they had a very good feeling about American people. But of course, at the government to government level, that's a different story. Uh, so I will get back to this rally point you mentioned. I was surprised by the size of the crowd and the passion uh, during Trump's rally. You so got, even you yeah. were surprised. I, I think we got to be physically on the spot, on the ground, mm. to get a feel of that person, like the size of the crowd, the way people talk, the way that how much noise that is made at the rally. So you compare Donald Trump's rally with that of DeSantis and Nikki Haley's. We went to all three of them. So I definitely got a feeling that mm. Trump why had the biggest support. Why do you think it is important for, for young students mm -hmm. to also get that experience, young students from China, to also mm -hmm. understand why Trump has so much popularity, especially mm -hmm. among the Republicans, and why is it important for them to, to understand that? It's, it's important because you know, if you want to study America for, as a scholar, as a student, and you want to get an, a, as objective view as possible, right? So sometimes you know, we, including myself, could be misled 
by information from journalists from American or Chinese side. And so once you are on the ground, you see with your own eyes and you have a better judgment. So I think, you know, singing is believing in many cases this is true. Yeah. yeah. But what did, mm, so you also talked about um, how mesmerizing mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. you know, a political figure can be mm -hmm. among the crowd and that's creating a kind of atmosphere yeah. that everybody gets involved in. Um, what should we prepare for <laughs> in terms of the outcome? <laughs> because people here are genuinely worried if Trump is re-elected. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about facts here. People have big question marks. Let's talk about it, given what he has advocated four years ago, three years ago. Well, I think you know, everybody here, or at least many people around the world, are rightfully worried about Donald Trump coming back to the White House. And my own sense is that he does have a fair good chance mm. of being uh, re-elected okay, yeah. for second term. Okay. Mm. And so, but back to the point about this, uh, you know, noise and politicians campaigning, you also get a sense like, you know, when we went to the rallies, you can see like everybody was kind of attacking the other person. Everybody was trying to say, you know, look at my record. But there is very little substantive discussion of what I would do on a particular policy issue. So in a word, I think for each of them, Trump, you know, DeSantis and Haley, there's a lot of this style messaging rather than really getting down to the policy details, like say, for example, what is wrong and what we, I propose to do, right? Read my lips and you know, all this. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, that's, that's one point you can definitely feel on the spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, Qing Zhi, I'm, I'm curious because you say you like that, right? You say, <laughs> you, say you even like um, a, a figure like um, um, Donald Trump, but you know, if he becomes elected as president of the United States, there could be very harsh consequences. For instance, he may reintroduce a trade war, a full-blown yeah. trade war against China. So what is your understanding about, are you not worried about that? I'm, I'm just curious, okay, after your trip to the I, United States. I definitely agree with that because... Uh, but still you like him I, as a person, as a character. I don't think I like him. I just like the feeling of attending those rallies, mm -hmm. getting emotional hyped. Okay. Do you think it is important for you as a student of foreign language and culture of international politics and relations to understand the on-site hype? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because when you learn those things on books, on news, those aren't actually real. I think it's actually real. Um, um, when you go there, you actually feel the uh, energy, the atmosphere, people are talking, shouting, and there, those speeches were delivered. Uh, individually to you, to yeah. you, and yeah. uh, you kind of feel that energy, the vibes, okay. so that you can understand the situation, the yes. policy, the the yeah, the policy making process better. Xu Chen Chen, let me ask you, uh, what did this whole trip uh, impressed upon you? What is your takeaway, so that you're going to apply in your study, in your research later on? Um, I think the most impression, uh, the most impressive memory, I, I totally agree, is the rally and the caucuses because one of our goals of this trip is to getting to know the U.S. politics by real life experience. And I think the biggest takeaway that I, from my own point of view, is that uh, because I'm an English major student and um, I studied uh, linguistics before and I'm very much harmed and also uh, uh, I'm inspired by Trump's way of displaying himself as okay. a speaker. <laughs> and as Trump a is an inspiration for a lot of Chinese students. Uh, okay. No, it's like it's like what I me meant by that is the I think the speeches and the words they use and the tactic, like Professor Xia just mentioned, by attacking their opponents instead of briefing on their own policies. There is kind of this language framing that we see in Trump's speech. And it really interests me myself is that how do the Republicans and uh, the Democrats, the progressives actually get their message through and getting their votes. And this language and this language framing that I would say is, I think it's really interesting of, of this yeah. uh, integrating my major with the politics in the US 
okay. uh, in the U.S. elections. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I understand what you're talking about. It's a double-edged sword, right? The power of uh, the ability to communicate. If you communicate uh, effectively, but to convey the right message is okay. But if you pursue a populist um, approach, then the, the effects can also be damaging. I'm not making any judgment here. I'm just saying, as a, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I hope I'm right. But um, once again, um, I'm happy that you went there, but the opposite seems to be very, very different. Right now, the latest numbers show there are 270,000 Chinese students studying in the United States, but there are about two, 350 <laughs> U.S. students studying in China. Uh, Jia Wen, let me g give this question to you. Um, do you think it would helpful? It would be helpful that more American students or American young people make the trip as you have done to the United States. Yes, of course. I think the nowadays as the uh, tensions with the tensions between the China U.S. I think the people-to-people -people exchanges, especially the dialogue among the youth of our two countries, is necessary because uh, if you. If you don't have the, uh, you know, the exchanges at the subnational levels, you will all only hear what the proper, uh, the media wants you to hear and what the, uh, the Chinese image is shaped by the politicians. Mm. But if you uh, study Chinese culture or you visit China uh, in person one day, you'll find that actually uh, the Chinese people are very friendly. Just we will treat you as you, uh, as those Americans treated us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice message. Um, Professor Xie, um, if you have an opportunity to send a message to American students who are interested in China, what would you say to them? And uh, um, is there an effort ongoing to make life easier for foreign visitors in general to visit and stay in China at least? <laughs> it is not easy at this moment, but uh, yeah. is there an effort? Is there genuine effort to make it happen? Well, I, I mean, my message to American students is that don't be scared by all this misinformation or inaccurate information about American scholars and students being detained, harassed by Chinese authorities. Just to buy a ticket, you know, come over to China and see with your own eyes. China is not as scary as you think or as some of the American media tell you to be. Right? So we had the same experience. You go there and see with your own eyes. I also have a message for American law enforcement officials, okay? Do not harass or question, interrogate Chinese students. They are friends of America. They come to America to study. And so if you keep questioning them, you keep deporting them without a fair reason, and then you are actually decoupling the most important ties between the two countries, that is people-to-people -people exchanges. Mm. Um, what would you, what would you say to the people who are kind of deterred because, for instance, the electronic payment system, or you know, people are talking about that, right? That they don't have the WeChat, they don't have the uh, Chinese uh, registered bank accounts and stuff mm. like that. What would you say to that? Because that seems to be a difficulty deterring some people. Well, you read the lips of the Chinese government spokesperson. They are trying their best, you know, to uh, update our system so that you know, so now if you bring American credit card, you can actually shop and uh, use Chinese public transit. A friend of mine from the uh, National University of Singapore, he visited me last semester, and so he just used an electronic system, and he navigated the whole Beijing public transportation system very well. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are catching up, but trust me, you know, the Chinese government is doing its best. Or basically, I should say, you have to catch up with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're <laughs> because right. we are ahead in this. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, delegation from the um, uh, Beijing Foreign Languages Study, headed by Professor Xie Tao, who is Dean of the School of International Relations and Diplomacy, and uh, his students, uh, Ling Jia Wen, Zhang Qingzhi, and Xi Chen Chen. Thank you very much. Yeah. With that, we come to the end of this uh, special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got The Point. Thank you very much.